Streaming now, this is the Wood TV Live Desk. And good afternoon, everyone. Phil Panarski here with the Wood TV Live Desk. Hope you're having a great start to your day. Digital reporter Matt Jarowski is back on the Live Desk, which means we are going to be discussing one of his latest Sunday stories. Matt, it's great to see you again. This story that you went in uh, this past Sunday dealt with one of West Michigan's most famous athletes of all time, but many may not even recognize the name at all. We're taking a look at the life and death of Stanley Ketchell, the mm -hmm. Michigan assassin. First things first, Matt, uh, tell us a little bit about who who Stanley Ketchell was for those who may not be familiar with him. Sure. So for those of you who aren't, you know, diehard boxing fans, Stanley Ketchell may not be a name you know or even Grand Rapids history buffs. Uh, Stanley Ketchell was, was born and raised here in Grand Rapids and really is among the boxing uh, greats. He was a world middleweight champion at one point. Um, and then unfortunately he died at only 24. His life and career very much cut short. And so there's a lot of of boxing aficionados, these kind of people um, that really believe that Ketchell really would be up there among some of the greats, you know, Muhammad Ali and Joe Lewis and these other names that are kind of household names. Ketchell never quite got to that level, and there are a lot of people that think he would have if uh, it weren't for his death. Mm -hmm, absolutely, and we're going to be discussing all that right here on the live desk, but I do encourage everybody, if you haven't gotten the chance to read Matt's story, you can find it right now on our website, woodtv.com. You can also find it in the comment section in the description box if you're watching this on Facebook, and you'll still be able to watch this entire conversation as well. Matt, uh, just from your own personal standpoint, you know, where, why did you decide that Stanley Ketchell was somebody that needed to have their story told? What kind of spurred on your desire to find out a little bit more about him? Right. Well, I knew the anniversary of his death was coming up, and so I wanted to share that story. It's one that uh, around Grand Rapids isn't really well known. Growing up, growing up here and growing up in sports circles, uh, Ketchell's not a household name, and so I wanted to try and help get that out there. Uh, I know a lot of times when people think Grand Rapids boxing, they think Floyd Mayweather, understandably so. He's a world-class boxer, mm -hmm. you know, uh, born and raised here, grew up in the Golden Glove system here. Uh, but Ketchell really carried that torch before Mayweather did. So Ketchell has a really interesting life story. Uh, his family uh, of Polish immigrants grew up on the west side of Grand Rapids over on Stocky Avenue. Uh, at 14, he left home, uh, headed out west, kind of rode the rails for a little while, and ended up uh, being hired as a, as a bar bouncer. And uh, of all places, that's where he honed his craft, so to say. He was not a classically trained uh, boxer or athlete by any means, and it was the bar, the bar owner that first realized, man, this kid can really throw a punch. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how he got his start in boxing. He, he started in local matches around Montana. Uh, eventually made his way out to California and grew through the ranks. He, went, he had like a three-year span where he he uh, didn't lose. It was like 39 some professional matches. A, a, wow. a really impressive career culminating uh, with that middleweight belt. Uh, he had one extremely, uh, the, the one historic fight he's most well known for is his bout with Jack Johnson, uh, who was the heavyweight champ at the time and was just untouchable. No one could beat him. Mm -hmm. uh, Ketchell and him were friends and they agreed to the fight. It was this big, massive build as a 20-round fight. Uh, and what makes it so interesting now is there are a lot of historians, there's been enough evidence uncovered that historians believe that fight was actually kind of fixed. The two men kind of went into the fight with a plan. Uh, they wanted it to go the full 20 so that the fight would get re-shown in theaters and they would make more money. So uh, it was kind of touch and go for a while. And then that script kind of fell apart in the 12th round. Uh, Ketchell infamously... Uh, knocking down Jack Johnson, and then within a matter of seconds, Johnson retaliated and uh, knocked Ketchell out cold. So it was a very, it's a very interesting uh, story. The video is online; it's buried on YouTube, uh, and we have a link to it in the story if you want to go check that out. As well as just explaining uh, that whole piece. But a really interesting uh, person, interesting career for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and that that Jack Johnson fight was a big part of the story, and uh, probably my favorite part reading that. Obviously. Uh, being somewhat familiar with the sport of boxing, you do know the name Jack Johnson. Mm -hmm. And so hearing that he actually had a fight against him and, you know, uh, they were friends. And uh, the twists and turns in that fight, obviously him uh, losing a couple of his teeth and uh, Johnson's yeah. glove as well was a pretty interesting mm -hmm. detail you included in the story. Um, but just kind of doing your research on it, what was it like uh, obviously having this prior knowledge to Jack Johnson and a little bit on Stanley Ketchell and then seeing them kind of collide and 
uh, just figuring out all the details of the fight and even watching the fight, as you mentioned, uh, the link to the full fight right now over on our website as well. Right, yeah, there's a lot of interesting resources out there. Um, and especially if you go back, uh, because we don't have the copyright to the video, we couldn't actually post the video mm -hmm. on our site or in our story. Uh, but there, there are video clips out there on YouTube, uh, and there, a lot of the reports talked about how uh, Ketchell's two front teeth were actually embedded in a Jack Johnson's glove when he was knocked out, and that you could see on the video him use his other glove to like wipe them away. Uh, it's 114 year old grainy video footage, and it's from <laughs> far away, so you can't really confirm that, but you do see him wipe at his glove. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of uh, you know really interesting material out there. Um, I've actually done a previous story on Jack Johnson about a year ago because he has his own interesting ties to Michigan in the Battle Creek area. That story uh, also linked in here. But really just talking about Jack Johnson, you know, those are two stories that intersect in a really fun way. Being able to talk about Ketchell's career and highlighting that on top of his really tragic death, um, it, was, it was a fun story to tackle. Mm -hmm. Right, and that kind of leads into what culminated the end of that story. Obviously, yeah. the death of Ketchell. Um, you know, we're approaching the 113th anniversary of that. Yep. Uh, did you, the way it was kind of laid out in the story, you know, obviously there's a lot of uh, hearsay and what, what co sort of the reasoning behind Ketchell's murder was. And uh, you did a great job, really, kind of explaining that we may never know. And there's all these right. different twists and turns. What do you, uh, when you were writing it and kind of just seeing all these different accounts of what happened or what may have happened what was your initial thought to seeing that and really how does that kind of uh if at all impact the legacy of Ketchell honestly yeah um there there is some impact on his local legacy and I'll mm -hmm. get into that in a second so real quick so what had happened was uh Ketchell eventually lost his middleweight title um to a man named Sam Langford he had fought a few more matches but at this point no Bear in mind, he's only 24, but this is a time period where they're fighting bouts every four to six weeks. We, we don't mm -hmm. see that anymore. I mean, these guys are boxing regularly. So he had well over 50 professional matches by the time he was 24. Um, so th that's something we just don't see now. So he was 24 but tired. Um, it w it's a really rough lifestyle being a boxer, and at that point you're traveling by rail. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not nearly as comfortable um, or, or as convenient as things we have now. Uh, so he came home uh, to Grand Rapids for a while um, just to kind of relax, rest his body, figure out where he wanted to go from here. There were talks about whether uh, he would go back to boxing. He might have been done. Um, but he also chose this other path, too, and this is what we do know. Um, there's a family friend, uh, Pete Dickerson, who uh, owned a, a big ranch in Missouri, and he offered... Uh, catch all the opportunity say hey why don't you come down you can be you know you can lead my ranch you can be the boss um see if you like it that way you can come down here if you don't want to go back to boxing this could be the next chapter in your life mm -hmm. or if you don't like it then you can go back and box or go do something else uh and it all kind of uh, unraveled really quickly so after a couple months he went down to missouri at right around this the same time as ketchell's getting acquainted on this ranch uh dickerson also hires a man named walter dipley uh, just as a ranch hand, and he uh, hires his girlfriend slash wife, it's very confusing there, <laughs> name's Goldie Smith, uh, to be a cook on her property. So there's a lot of different uh, stories thrown out there as far as what, as far as what happened. What we do know is that uh, one morning, uh, October 6th, I believe the day was, uh, whatever Sunday was, no, it wasn't mm -hmm. the 6th, 15th, um, Dipley came through the back door of the kitchen uh, and, and shot Ketchell, uh, shot him through the shoulder and into his lung. Um, and then uh, the two robbed him and they left, they took off. Uh, so Ketchell died about 12 hours later. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as why that happened, there's a lot of different stories out there. Uh, at first, uh, Dipley claimed self-defense. He said that Ketchell uh, actually pulled a gun on him first um, and that and that could be true because he was known to carry a gun, a pistol, uh, and he did have it on him at the time of the shooting. Mm -hmm. uh, then stories also came out later that Dipley uh, ambushed him because Ketchell allegedly raped Goldie Smith the night before. Um, so there was anger over that. There's another story that Dipley was upset, not because of anything to do with Goldie Smith, but because uh, 
he was, Dipley was uh, handling a horse in a very rough way the day before, uh, and Ketchell gave him a dressing down for that. He wasn't happy with that. Uh, and then my, my favorite story, because it's the most conspiratorial, mm -hmm. is that Dipley was somehow hired by mobsters because Ketchell had unpaid gambling debts, which there's really no evidence that that's true. We also can't rule it out. Ketchell was very much a uh, fly by the seat of his pants kind of guy in the Jack Johnson fight. Uh, there's one historian that says all the money he made from that fight, he lost hours later to Jack Johnson playing dice. So you can't necessarily rule out that Ketchell may have been involved with some more nefarious activities as well. But regardless, what happens is Ketchell ultimately passed away from his injuries. Uh, Dipley and Smith are both eventually arrested and charged uh, uh, in that death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it definitely adds, a, as I mentioned, another layer of mystery kind of just surrounding the life of Stanley Ketchell and kind of makes it a little bit more interesting to read about and kind of just learn a little bit more about uh, a piece of West Michigan history. And yep. uh, Matt, you know, obviously the story turned out really, really well. Um, again, I encourage everybody to check it out if you haven't already. But uh, with these stories, obviously you put a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of research into them. Uh, what was your biggest takeaway, I guess, from this story? Is there anything that maybe you uh, is always going to stick with you or something that you just found absolutely entertaining and interesting that you d had never heard of before? Yeah, uh, I would say the fact that Ketchell is a bit of an unknown around here. I mean, there are plenty of people that know who Stanley Ketchell is. Mm -hmm. um, but just as far as a Grand Rapids name, I don't feel like he's up there. Um, at the time, this was national news. When Ketchell was killed, obviously the fact that a, a major boxer was, was murdered is going to make a lot of headlines. Um, but it really it took Grand Rapids by storm. It was a big deal when his uh, body was returned uh, to the city. He was buried up here. Mm -hmm. um, his funeral drew more than 5,000 people. It's really considered one of the largest gatherings um, in the city's history, especially at, at that point. Uh, and his grave uh, marker is still up there, Holy Cross Cemetery. I've got uh, pictures of video of that inside the story. You can go see it for yourself. It includes a pair of old boxing mitts that have been... Uh, hung out the cross at the top of his grave marker. Uh, but just really how he's remembered around the city. I don't actually remember how much of this made uh, the actual story, but um, before, so there's currently a statue of Ketchell down on Bridge Street, uh, which you can also go check out. Before there was a statue, there was a marker that was um, unveiled in the 1990s uh, to kind of honor him growing up as a West Sider. Um, uh, when Van Andel Arena was first being built and proposed, there was a movement to have the arena named after Ketchell. Obviously, that they went in a different direction uh, with Van Andel, one of the, the arena's key donors and supporters there. And then also just the little touches of when he, in his prime, he bought his family a bunch of property up in Plainfield Township over off of Little Pine Island Lake. Uh, and so the street that, that uh, touches that part of the shoreline is called Ketchell Drive. And that's still there. How many people uh, drive through that neighborhood, drive past that street, know the name Ketchell Drive, but they don't know Ketchell? So mm -hmm. but that's, that was the part that stood out to me. Yeah, no, I definitely do think that uh, people who do check out the story will now know a little bit more about Stanley yeah. Ketchell. And the name will start to catch on a little bit here across West Michigan. And again, that story is live right now over on our website, woodtv.com. If you haven't gotten the chance to check it out, I highly encourage you to do so. Great piece of West Michigan history there. Matt, thank you so much for stopping by the live desk once again. It's great to see you. Anytime. Thank you. Yep, absolutely. And I want to thank everybody else for tuning in to this latest edition of the Wood TV Live Desk. I'm Phil Panarski, and we hope you have a great rest of your day.